Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker. I'm your host. I'm very happy today to have a, as our guest, Representative Taylor Small. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Ed. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I know that your, your day is busy, to say the least. <clears throat> you are right about that one. <laughs> Taylor is in her second uh, term as a member of the Vermont House of Representatives and really representing Chittenden County and very well versed in this public health um, emergency, catastrophic emergency that we face in Vermont today. And that'll be the topic of our, our discussion. Taylor, just in your own words, could you, I mean, describe what you feel about what's going on, what you see going on. You've been watching this for a number of years now. What, what, what do you make of it? What do we make of this? Um, I mean, simply put out, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to know that when these conversations first started, we were talking about an opioid crisis. We were talking about recognizing that pharmaceutical companies were to blame for a lot of addiction that we were seeing in our communities. And we were starting to talk about uh, getting folks into treatment and what recovery would look like. And now, because we haven't been as aggressive as the drugs that are coming out onto the streets, um, we are now having to talk about an overdose death crisis. We have to talk about addressing overdoses instead of just addressing substance use disorder at its core. And that is, is what's most devastating. I think back to my first year in office when we were working on this, um, we had the very poignant message said to us that 180 people had died of overdoses in that year. And to think, as elected representatives in the state of Vermont, there are 180 of us that occupy those seats. Oh. There was a moment taken where uh, Representative Dane Whitman presented this bill and said, um, for every seat that we occupy, that is one person that has died in the state. And I said, I don't want to see that again. And I came back the next year, and Vermont once again set a record with over 200 deaths. What year was that first year? The first year, uh, so I came in in 2021, so I believe 2022 is when we first tried to pass mm -hmm. um, H728 uh, focused on overdose prevention. And that was simply to study overdose prevention sites, and that was vetoed. And then uh, it really showed that that work was needed when we set another record the next year. And again, this coming year, we're about to set another record of overdose deaths. And that's not what I want to see for Vermont. I think we're really backtracking in what... Um, is addressing this issue and really focusing on the fact that we have a hub and spoke model, which yes, is helpful in getting folks into treatment, but is not the panacea of what the current, uh, what is currently happening on the streets. You know, I mean, you describe it so poignantly that in the year that you began your service in the Vermont House of Representatives, there was exactly the number of overdose deaths as there are seats in the house. That's mind-boggling. It is. Since then, the Centers for Disease Control has a little bit of a different estimate of death in Vermont. Their estimate for Vermont in 2022 was 264. Beloved Vermont was taken from us, 264. Do you, um, do you have figures at hand uh, for Chittenden County for 2022 or going into 2023? Um, I don't have those figures um, right offhand, but I know that the rate of overdose in Chittenden County is escalating to the point that uh, unlikely characters are coming out of the works to say, hey, what we are doing is not working. Mm -hmm. I think in particular what is really highlighted for me is our emergency medical services, mm -hmm. um, as well as our fire department, who is mm -hmm. saying we are spending more of our time responding to and addressing overdoses in communities yeah. than we are to doing our regular jobs. We're yeah. being held up by addressing uh, substance use disorder in our yeah. communities. And because of us not taking action on the state level, we're putting it back on communities and local fire departments and EMS agencies to try to figure out new solutions. Yeah. So in Burlington, we saw that the fire department was seeing this increase in calls. And so they started having just a rapid response for overdoses alone. Yeah. I think that is so commendable of what we are seeing in Burlington, and yet that is not what I want to be seeing. I want us to be addressing this as a state issue and thinking more broadly than a case-by-case -case or municipality uh, idea. I, I, I understand, and um, I do have the figure for, for 2022 because, because I've spoken with Sarah George uh, lately. It was 54, 54 people 
in Chittenden County, mm -hmm. just in our county, and the majority of them are concentrated in downtown Burlington. And just to highlight your point about the um, police department and the fire department, um, Chief Lachance, I recently saw him speak, and he quoted that this year, 2023, the number of overdose responses is going to be 2.5 times higher than the national than the um, um, city average for the past three years. So 250 percent more. These these people are back on their heels, and like you say, the, their response is commendable. Mm -hmm. To have fire department personnel working overtime, not taking out fire engines, but in a a van, reversing overdoses. I, I couldn't agree with you more. But it, it shouldn't be that way. Right. We should have services that are more um, medically based, more science based, more available to us that we don't have. And um, it's the same thing when you look at, we look at the citizenship of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Every place I go, People are, are in a deep grief about what's happening here. They have a, a tremendous motivation to do something about what's happening here. But they're sort of almost being stopped by the status quo. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like you to speak a little bit about that, that kind of momentum we have to do what's best, but the fact that we're not being allowed to. Yeah, I think uh, in recognition that this has been, at minimum, a seven-year conversation in Vermont about hosting an overdose prevention center and really thinking about evidence-based uh, just interventions that uh, might not be popular at the time but are actually life-saving. Mm -hmm. And so when we think of how the trajectory of overdose prevention centers, especially from the uh, state legislative perspective, mm -hmm. um, and 2018 was the first time that this really came up as a potential option and where we studied it. And at that time, we looked at biased research um, that came together to say that uh, there would be no buy-in here in Vermont uh, within our communities to put overdose prevention centers forward, that there was no research or data into the rural efficacy of these uh, centers, and that it just wasn't needed. That's simply what the report said. I remember that. And we came back and um, we decided, no, we want to really focus on folks who are doing this research. We want to look at the feasibility right here in Vermont based on data that we can look right above us up in Canada, mm -hmm. where there are rural interventions, there are mobile interventions. Mm -hmm. And um, when we tried to pass that legislation, it was vetoed in the, the last biennium. And the governor in his, uh, his veto letter uh, very vehemently opposed safe injection sites. Mm -hmm. And that is not the language that we're using in any of our legislation because we recognize that not only does using the language of safe injection sites or safe injection facilities um, increase this idea of stigma. Um, as you and I have talked many times, it creates this image of what is happening within those facilities. Yeah. It's simply, yeah. um, for myself, it conjures this image of someone who is just going in to use drugs and then they're going to leave. Yeah. And yet, when we talk about overdose prevention centers, they are so much more than that. Yeah. And so, yeah. as we're having these conversations, we're talking about, yes, it is a place for folks to use pre-obtained drugs in a safer manner um, under the supervision of medical or trained professionals. And it also is not just about injection, because when we're talking about safer consumption, we're not saying that it is safe to consume drugs. If it was safe to consume drugs, we wouldn't be putting overdose prevention centers in place. But what we are saying is that there are other ways that folks can consume drugs that would reduce their likelihood of overdose and reduce their likelihood of death. And that's what these facilities are. They're educational, they're prevention, and when we look at the data as to where other overdose prevention centers are, we know that about 80% of folks within a two-year time period are going to get connected to treatment or additional services where they are on that path uh, way to recovery. And so 
to be constantly going head to head with an administration that is not looking at the science, even though they are saying that they are looking for data and they are looking at the research, but they are neglecting the science that is right here in the United States, um, neglecting the research of other health departments such as Rhode Island or most recently Massachusetts saying that these are not only evidence-based but necessary interventions. Um, it makes it really hard for the average Vermonter to truly understand what an overdose prevention center is and why we would move forward with such an intervention. And instead what we hear is more stigma about who is using drugs, where they are using drugs currently, and what those activities look like in our communities, um, especially in the realm of public safety. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't um, agree with you more. And it's such a pleasure to, um, to talk to someone and have someone on the show <clears throat> who's actually done their homework, who has reviewed the literature, listened to experts more than once, and, and integrated the information in, in a way, you know, that, that's not biased, to open yourself and be changed by science, be changed by your experience. I was abstinence-based, abstinence-centric for a very, very long time. But what happened to me in my career was I began to see people dying when we tried to offer them services based on accomplishments they couldn't meet. Like, don't take drugs and we'll help you. Yeah. The people that are dying on our streets most frequently are the people that are most difficult to engage and they are taking drugs. An overdose prevention center, just to highlight what you're saying, is a place that says, come to us while you're taking drugs. Mm -hmm. We care about you so much that we're not going to place unrealistic demands on you, and we're going to help you to stay alive because, tragically, the drugs you're taking are, are lethal. You know Kaylin C. I and do. I, I know Kaylin C. For the viewers, Kaylin C. is the special project director at On Point New York City, the first overdose prevention center in, in America. And, and what she says is the actual observing of the self-administration of drugs at the overdose prevention center is that's the least time they spend with a participant. They talk to them, they get to know them, they engage them, they help them with their needs, they refer them for um, health supporting services. 85, 90% of the time spent with these people is really in harm reduction and um, health support. So to call a center like that an injection facility is clearly the intentional use of stigmatized language to miseducate the public. Would you agree on that? I would absolutely agree. And I think um, to your point and really recognizing what is happening on our streets and when we look at our drug supply, we need new interventions when there is uh, new data being presented. Yeah. And so it just, it, it is staggering to think about, and I didn't think Vermont would get to this point, but when we were receiving testimony from the um, overdose prevention centers up in Canada and the researchers doing this work, they talked about how the drug supply up there moved from being um, pharmaceutical prescription opioids to heroin mm -hmm. to just fentanyl, where mm -hmm. they're not even seeing heroin come uh, across their toxicology reports. Yeah. And I think what was most staggering in the, mo in the recent CompStat meeting for Burlington was to see that the majority, the vast majority of overdoses are fentanyl-based, and only about three of them, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah. were heroin. Yeah. And then we're mixing these drugs of um, extremely fatal uh, fentanyl with xylazine. Mm -hmm. So we have these overdose uh, reversal agents in community, and yet that is not going to combat the xylazine that is also in the drug supply. And I think that's just one variation of the mixtures that we're seeing that is increasing this likelihood of overdose death. Yeah. And so if we were talking about the same issue. If we were talking about the same problem of the pharmaceutical industry and folks being overprescribed um, or being addicted to prescription opiates, then the, the hub and spoke model actually works. It mm -hmm. works in that very limited capacity. Mm -hmm. And now we have to be looking at the hub and spoke model as just 
one uh, tool in our tool belt. I think there are also many improvements that need to be made to our hub and spoke model because of the impact of fentanyl. We know that buprenorphine is not necessarily the panacea in getting folks uh, connected to medication assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and yet methadone is so much more difficult for folks to access on a regular and consistent yeah. basis. Yeah. Gosh, one story that always sticks with me is um, when we were, had the ability to go vin uh, visit Jenna's Promise up in Johnson, Vermont. Mm -hmm. And one of their employees there was saying how um, he has successfully been on methadone for the last year. And when we asked about it, like, how is this working? How is it helping with you in getting into employment? He said, well, the most challenging thing for me is to get to work on time. Because right now, while I'm here in Johnson, I have to drive an hour, an hour and a half to Newport, Vermont to get methadone before my shift starts. And I have to make sure that it is within the hours that the uh, hub is even open. And so there are just so many barriers for folks to consistently maintain on treatment yeah. that it feels like we are setting folks up for failure if we are not actually looking at how we bring services back to the people who need it most. I, I, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. And I know that um, our, our wonderful uh, mayor, Weinberger, uh, is pressing now for um, low barrier access to methadone for exactly those reasons. It works with people who have fentanyl addiction. And I want to highlight the fact that there's money been allocated by the legislature mm -hmm. uh, that was allocated from the Opioid uh, Abatement Settlement Committee for exactly that. But the money is lying there because of red tape, and it may lie there for 16 months because of red tape. Um, so I want to I want to just for the viewing audience I want to say that we will be convening a panel at the end of the show with with, with Taylor Tanya Vahovsky, Representative Taylor, Senator Vahovsky, um, Mayor Weinberger, Miro, Miro Weinberger, and our state's attorney Sarah George. And we're going to be looking at this, but to just summarize for for today. Um, Taylor, I think what, what, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are basically three points. One, that there is um, an ever accelerating um, velocity of accidental overdose death in Vermont, mm -hmm. and this will continue, and we're not doing everything we can about it. Very true. Two, that the governor and, and, and forces that align with the governor are actively discouraging us from implementing overdose prevention centers, which are a science-based, medically necessary service that will help this, the same population that's dying. Mm -hmm. Three, that, that there is money available specifically opioid um, settlement money. And also we have tremendous reserves in the state coffers, $264 million, I read somewhere. Oh, I do not have that information. Yeah, I read, that, I read that today somewhere. There's, there's, there's a reserve. That, that money that's available is not being released in an urgent, timely fashion. Would you agree with those three points? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, to the third point, I think... It is unintentional that the money is being held up. I will give them that. Mm -hmm. But the unintentionality is due to maintaining a lean government. And that is something... Maintaining what? A lean government. And okay. Governor Scott has been very adamant about this, mm -hmm. of not having a robust state government. Mm -hmm. And instead, what this means is that when we don't have positions filled within state government, it takes longer and longer for us to have the solutions come to fruition. So it is one thing for us to pass legislation and for us to um, allocate funding from our state budget to various nonprofits or to the folks who are actually going to be doing this work in our communities. Mm -hmm. 
It is another to have uh, follow through and implementation from the executive branch on what has been done within the legislature. And so my hope is that we can move in a direction where our state agencies are fully um, brought up to staffing, where we're not running into these workforce issues, and where we're having grants that are going out in a timely manner mm -hmm. so that we can be responsive mm -hmm. to these issues. Mm -hmm. Because not only are we not seeing money being addressed for methadone, but I think another important component is drug checking. Mm -hmm. um, that folks do not even know the drugs that they are using because it is an unregulated supply. Mm -hmm. And with that unregulated supply, we need to be able to know if we're not going to have overdose prevention centers, how we can address or at least let folks um, reduce the harm or use more mm -hmm. safely um, the substances that they're already going to be consuming. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so well said. And uh, I'm so grateful to have you as a leader in, in, our, in our beloved state. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful to be doing it and yeah. uh, truly honored to be having this conversation with you because I think uh, we don't talk about it enough. I think we can address that there is an issue and that it is heartbreaking and devastating for all of us in our communities. But it is so often that we don't get to the point of what are the actual solutions that we can yeah. put in place. Yeah. So thank you, and we will continue with uh, solutions at the end of the program.